these are this afternoon's the top stories. Shopkeeper shot during robbery. Bahamas passed bills to protect against U.S. tax evasion and fraud. And protesters take to the streets of Ferguson, Missouri during Black Teens Memorial. Good afternoon. Welcome to the ZIZ Midday Newscast. Today is Monday, 10th August 2015. I am Nisha David. In national news, ZIZ received reports that there was a shooting incident late last evening in an attempted robbery of a small shop in Old Road. Divisional Commander for the area, Superintendent Cromwell Henry, confirmed that around 10.30 Sunday night, a report was made to the Old Road Police Station that Frederick James, also known as Gabby of half a tree, was shot in the left leg after two masked men approached him and Dr. Charles Warner, a former candidate for the St. Christopher Four for the People's Action Movement, and demanded money. Superintendent Henry says Frederick James and Dr. Warner were leaving the business place having closed for the night when the gunmen approached. James was subsequently shot because he didn't initially correspond. The gunmen took an undisclosed amount of money from James and from Dr. Warner. They took about $250, his bank cards, other personal items, and made their escape. James is currently warded at the JNF Hospital. In the meantime, the investigation continues and the police is urging anyone with information to call your nearest police station and or crime stoppers at 1-800-8477. Stakeholders in the protection of the Narrows, the body of water between St. Kitts and Nevis, were taken on a catamaran cruise to the area on Saturday to see and experience the area firsthand. This comes as the Department of Fisheries pushes ahead with its project to establish the Narrows as a marine managed area. According to fisheries officer Tricia Grio, the trip is part of an overall sensitization program to inform stakeholders and the general public about the project to preserve the area. This is the first of many with regards to our communication strategic plan, implementing the communication strategic plan and really engaging the stakeholders, getting them out there, actually getting them wet and so they're able to really feel and appreciate the natural resources that are within the Narrows Marine Managed Area, well the proposed Narrows Marine Managed Area. Marine Resources Department officials told us that I said that one of the goals of the project is to counter the natural and man-made factors that are endangering the fish population. Former principal of the Bastia High School, Carleen Henry Morton, is the new permanent secretary of the Ministry of Tourism. Morton took up her post on Monday morning, taking over from Dianeel Williams, who was acting permanent secretary from November 2014. Regionally in the Bahamas, two bills have been passed with the objective of targeting non-compliance by U.S. taxpayers with foreign accounts and assets there. ZNS News in the Bahamas says the Foreign Accounts Tax Compliance Act, or FACTA, and the Travelers' Currency Declaration Bill were passed on Friday. The leader of government business in the Senate said the global financial compliance effort by the U.S. is to protect against tax evasion and fraud. With the Traveler's Currency Declaration Bill, travelers will be required to declare when they're bringing money of more than $10,000 into the country. If we intend to grow our sector for the benefit of Bahamians, the Bahamas and the Bahamian people, we have to recognize that we are participants in a world financial sector and we do everything that we can to protect the integrity of the world financial sector. And in a nutshell, that is what this bill is all about, to enable Bahamians to continue to benefit from financial services, for financial services to grow, to benefit our people. 
Now, Maynard Gibson says the implementation of the two bills is an effort to ensure the Bahamas is not used as a center for money laundering and financing of terrorism. Senator Michael Pintard supported the bill, noting that the Bahamas has helped other countries set up their own compliance regimes. He says regulatory organizations must be fair in assessments of jurisdictions and not single out small island states when the countries that pose regulations are found wanting. He urged the government to be cautious. In setting up the agency that we are now in the process of doing, we are merely serving as a conduit through which information would come from financial institutions and go to the U.S. Uh, we run the reputational risk that if that information is not accurate, while those financial or, um, services organizations are going to feel the brunt of the uh, U.S. law, the Bahamas as a jurisdiction itself is going to suffer. Guyana's finance minister is rejecting an article published in the Friday, August 7th edition of the Guyana Times, which reports on an increase of the pocket allowance for ministers from U.S. $25 per day to $500 per day. The minister said that since 1993, the allowances have remained the same and instead of making changes, the new government will be tightening the leases on allowances. Capital News has more details in this story. Finance Minister Winston Jordan today rolled out documents in his defense as he set the record straight on traveling allowances given to ministers under the new government. While the former People's Progressive Party Civic Administration is making noise on the issue, they are the ones who went against the approved rates, according to the minister. He pointed to a previous cabinet decision in October of 2014, where former finance minister Dr. Ashni Singh and an official traveling to the United States were given more than the approved rates. You have your 19, you have your circle that says rates for ministers are $200. Up, this is up to me, okay? Rates for ministers are $200, okay? But you have a circle, a, a, a cabinet decision, okay, that gives a minister here $355 per night. And Mr. Edgell says, by the way, no minister was given more than $150 per night. The official who traveled with Dr. Singh should have received U.S. $150. Instead, he was given U.S. $355 for hotel accommodation per night. That's all? Okay. So the point being made here, I'm not knocking these officials. I'm not saying that, you know, that the thing. But the point being made here that rates can only be a guide. That you can't, at the level of a cabinet or a circular, um, have moving rates. You have to have some guide. Jordan said under the new rates, ministers will travel business class while receiving U.S. $275 for hotel accommodation in the Caribbean and North America and $352 in Europe and Asia. Permanent secretaries and other staff will receive U.S. $175 and U.S. $250 respectively. The rates for meals and out-of-pocket remains the same, U.S. $100 and U.S. $25 respectively. I could tell you how mean we have got so far. We have now broken the $100 into three parts. Breakfast, $25. Lunch, $35. Dinner, $40. So that's how the 100 Because the practice has been for people to claim the entire $100 for the day, even while you are flying in the air. Jordan said since this government took office, no contingency fees were given to any minister. He, however, stated that he has known of previous ministers under the previous administration who collected contingency fees for specific purposes that were not utilized. But those funds, he said, were never returned to the government coffers. Instead, they were pocketed. Jordan refused to provide names. Reporting for Capital News, I for Wharton. Internationally, protesters took to the streets of Ferguson, Missouri on Sunday, one year after the fatal shooting of unarmed black teenager Michael Brown. More in this Euronews report. One year on from the fatal shooting of unarmed black teenager Michael Brown, 
protesters were back on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri overnight. Shots were fired during the otherwise peaceful demonstration. Two unmarked police cars were hit, according to officials. At least one person was reported injured. Earlier police had urged protesters to clear the streets. So I believe what we've done to date is we allow people to protest, but we've also allowed for people to disseminate. We've given them plenty of egress so that they can leave. We've given over 15 orders to disperse, and we've been very patient. But at some point, some of these folks are going to have to get off the roadway, and we're going to have to take some enforcement action. The killing of 18-year-old Brown by Officer Darren Wilson, who was white, sparked protests across the U.S. Demonstrators accused the police of racial bias. No charges were brought against Wilson in the end. He since retired from the police force. USA Today reports that the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, mistakenly released 3 million gallons of toxic wastewater from an abandoned mine into Colorado's Animas River. That number is three times its original estimate. The mine is still leaking and the orange sludge is still moving. It stayed intact all the way from the headwaters of Cement Creek, down the Animas, through Durango, all the way to New Mexico. It's been five days since the incident at the abandoned Gold King Mine in Silverton. The EPA now estimating one of its teams mistakenly released three million gallons of toxic wastewater. These problems happen all the time. Almost every abandoned mine uh, has the potential for that situation. CU professor Mark Williams has seen it happen before. Groundwater rising inside a plugged up mine, finding its way out. And he's worked with the EPA at mine sites in Colorado to prevent it. They're going to then, at a tracer, groundwater is going to rise and it's going to come out somewhere else. Inside his boulder lab, Williams uses jugs of water and food coloring to show how tracers can help understand where the water comes from and how it moves inside a mine. We learn about the hydrology, how the water gets into the mine, and then try and turn it off or move it somewhere else where it's not a problem. For now, the problem is still flowing at 500 gallons per minute. In some ways, uh, the worst we've seen because of that yellow sludge. Taking a look at the weather, weather forecast for St. Kitts and Nevis today will be sunny, while tonight is expected to be partly cloudy with a chance of few showers. Temperature for today should peak at 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Seas are slight to moderate with waves up to 5 feet. That brings us to the end of the ZIZ Midday Newscast. Join us this evening for these stories and more in detail. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nisha David.